Chapter Thirteen of the Child of the Moat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Child of the Moat by Ian Bernard Stoughton Holborn. Chapter Thirteen: Coming Events Cast Shadows. It was a fine moonlit night, and Ian was pacing up and down by the side of the stream. He walked very fast, partly because the season was getting cold, and partly to calm his mind. He was agitated concerning the future and troubled not only about himself, but about Aline. He was now distinctly better in health and felt he would soon be well enough to leave Holwick Hall. There were many difficulties. First, there was the immediate danger of getting away unseen. Then, when he had performed his mission in Carlisle, there was the problem of the future. He would be safer in Scotland, but he did not want to be too far away from Aline. She might need his help. Again he felt that sense of apprehension, almost of terror. Something was going to happen, but what? Which way was he to meet it? This threatening, uncertain atmosphere, what did it portend? Aline seemed touched by it. He had not spoken to her about it, but he had noticed it in her manner. Indeed, they seemed mutually aware of it as he looked into her eyes. In any case, he could not go to his father's house. Should he go to Scotland at all? The country he knew was in great confusion, torn between her fear of France and the regent Mary of Guise on the one hand, and her hatred of England on the other. He was strongly tempted to go and fight, if fighting were to be done, and the very documents that he carried might be the things that would bring matters to a head. On the other hand, if there were no fighting, he felt drawn to do something more for the faith. He had no home duties, and he hated inactivity. At last he settled the matter. Of course, the papers were to be safely delivered first, but neither the fighting in Scotland nor Eileen's need for his help could be reckoned on as certainty. He would stay in Carlisle and be in reach of both. As for the reformed faith, he had for some time come to the conclusion that the calling of a packman offered the best opportunities for spreading the word. This, however, would require money which at present he had not got. He would therefore try and find work as a smith or a carpenter in Carlisle, until he had saved the money. That matter was settled then, and his health was now such that his departure must not be long delayed. He stood still and looked up at the clear sky. The roar of the waterfall not half a mile away filled the silence of the night. It was very peaceful, and the hills were bathed in a sad, mysterious beauty. But through all the calm lurked a suggestion of dread. Dare he leave the child behind at all? Yet if he took her, he would be putting her to greater risks every moment than the worst she could suffer from Mistress Mowbray. Besides, how could the expenses be met? For the scheme would be impossible without horses, as, although he himself could escape alone on foot, immediately Aline disappeared a hue and cry would be raised. His mind grew tired with thinking, and finally he began to build wild castles in the air, in which he took the child with him on foot, and fought pursuer after pursuer until he was slain himself, not, however, before he had managed to put Aline into a sure place of safety and happiness. He had wandered rather further than usual down the stream, and decided that he had better turn back. Moreover, it was late, and it would soon be daylight. He retraced his steps until he came within a few paces of the opening that led to the cave, and was intending to enter when he caught sight of a dark figure, seated under a small birch-tree, that had found a sheltering place in this hollow on the bleak moor. It was a woman, and she was watching him. The shock was so sudden that he had the greatest difficulty in preserving his presence of mind. He decided to continue in the direction he was going, as though bound on some definite journey. "'You like the night air, stranger, for your travels,' she said in a shrill voice. She evidently did not mean to let him pass her. "'Aye, mother,' he said, "'a night like this is as good for travel as the day.' He gathered at once who it was from Aline's description. It was Moll of the Graves, and she seemed to rivet him to the spot with the gaze of her unholy but still beautiful eyes." She was holding a bone in her claw-like hands, and was gnawing the flesh off of it. He could not help noticing that she yet had excellent teeth. Could she by any chance know who he was? In any case she had seen him now, so he might stand and see if he could draw her out. However, she went on. "'I've heard physicians recommend the night air for travellers with a sick conscience.' 
then if that be the case he answered it might apply to you as well as to me perhaps it may she said but i enjoy the fresh night air for its own sake o moon that watches from the sky we see strange things the moon and i crooned the old woman beating time with her staff do you know this part of the world she said suddenly i cannot say that i do he answered then you miss things that are worth knowing there are all manners of folk about here from the master of holwick to miser simpson from bullying eleanor mowbray to gentle janet arnside and from tough withered bloodless old elspeth to fresh tender morsels like aline that dropped in the moat she said as she grinned showing her teeth and i know the fortunes of them all the old woman was eyeing him keenly but he managed to betray no particular interest he thought however that he had better move away lest she should ask him such questions that he would lose more than anything he would gain from talking to her he was thankful she had not seen him go into the cave i think i must be moving on he said will you not wait and hear your future told no i thank you that can bide it's not good anyhow said old moll with a vindictive light in her eyes it begins with heartache and goes on to worse good night to you said ian and started up the gully are you not coming back to your hiding place in there the old woman called maliciously i saw you come out and i shall be sitting here till you come back horrible old villain he said to himself but he called out no it's all right for a temporary shelter but no one could stay there things indeed looked serious how was he to get back but he could not bear the thought of not saying good-bye to the children besides they absolutely must know that part of their secret had been discovered he decided that unless the old hag roused his pursuers he was fairly safe he could keep out of sight in bog holes or the like during the day if someone came very near he must chance it and move on true there was some risk but aline must know the old woman was in the hollow where she could not see him so he crept round and hid himself where he could watch without being observed when daylight came he saw her rise and go into the outer cave but he could not see what further she did she then came back and sat down hours passed on but she did not move about midday she produced a small sack from under her kirtle and took something out and gnawed at it as before she did the same again towards evening ian felt faint and hungry but determined not to give in even if he had to wait another night though as he would have to go some twenty miles before he dared ask for food his plight was becoming desperate he crept quite close to her on the bare chance of her going to sleep in such a way that he could be quite sure of it and be able to slip past however toward sunset he heard her mutter to herself well i cannot wait any more it will be too cold she rose and hobbled over to the cave where she broke down a light switch and bent it across the entrance as though it had accidentally been done by the wind or some animal she started a step or two down the little gully and then came back to her resting place and looked about she picked up three bones they might tell tales she murmured and hiding them under her mantle she walked down toward the river when she reached the river she threw the bones into the dark water and watched them sink but this ian did not see when moll had gone ian went back to the secret room he was overwrought this was a new peril for aline and it made him grasp what he had not realized before that if the children were caught harboring a heretic the consequences would be terrible indeed he must get away forthwith he went to bed but he could not sleep how far had he really been wise after all to say anything to aline about the new faith she certainly was a most unusual child but perplexities and responsibilities might even be too much for an adult was not my first instinct right he argued children are too delicate too frail too beautiful to be flung into the anxieties of life there is a good deal to be said even for the priests he reflected responsibility may become too crushing altogether then too his own mind was not at ease about the course that things were taking either in scotland or england on the whole he felt that the protestants were nearer the truth but there was a beauty and a spirituality of holiness not unconnected with the beauty of holiness itself which he saw in the old faith and which he was not willing to abandon i would not have a faith without beauty he said it would be a travesty of faith an unlovely thing and no faith at all 
if we do not consider the lilies which we have seen we shall certainly never be able to understand the king in his beauty whom we have not seen and of a surety the child flower hath lifted me higher than any other experience of my life but methinks it is meet that both sides should be presented and some day we may grow broad-minded enough to learn each from the other he lay awake most of the night so that when the children came down in the evening he was looking tired and worn they came in slowly very downcast and sad suppose that ian had disappeared for good and that they would never see him again he was seated where they could not see him at once but when they caught sight of him they both rushed forward oh you are here safe and sound what has happened i am so glad said both in a breath each child flung her arms round him and kissed him you will pull my head off if you're not careful he said laughing oh you did give us a terrible fright exclaimed aline yes we came and found the room empty said audrey and we hunted all down the passage to the cave room and i wanted to go through but aline said no there is evidently something wrong and it might not be safe we had better come round outside i am glad you were cautious ian interposed but first we went down the other passage and found nothing and then we set out aline said we must be very careful in coming near the cave so we crept round very slowly and suddenly what do you think we saw well what did you see we saw Mall of the graves said aline and we stooped down at once and then ran away she did not see us as the back of her head was turned our way i'm thankful for that said ian and then recounted his experiences he omitted the bone incident but concluded by saying we must be careful about that birch twig she evidently set it as a trap do you suppose that she discovered the inner cave the cave room itself asked audrey apprehensively not at all likely said ian she cannot stand up straight even besides she was not there long of that i am certain audrey gave a sigh of relief but she may tell other people said ian you must keep your ears open very carefully it was an awe-inspiring prospect the future certainly was not reassuring in order to give a new turn to the conversation, Aline said, "'Do you know, the day before yesterday, I went over to Newbiggin and talked to several of the people. I did not ask any questions, but they told me a great deal of themselves. There evidently are some pretty fair scoundrels in the village, even on their own showing.' "'What are you going to do?' said Ian. "'I do not know yet,' she said. "'I must find out some more, but I am tolerably sure that the villains are in the minority.' i do not suppose there is much to choose said audrey i should let them all go why trouble yourself but audrey aline objected you yourself hate unfairness i cannot bear to think of mistress mowbray having her own way with those who are innocent i think also my princess enjoys some other kinds of fighting than with foils ian interposed well perhaps there's a little bit in that too my father was a fighter somehow little one said ian i cannot help wishing you would leave it alone i feel you would be better to have nothing to do with newbiggin it sounds very silly but old moll lives in newbiggin and i have a strange dread of it that i cannot explain that is very curious said audrey so have i there has been something weighing on me like a bad dream for many days i cannot explain it aline dear you let it alone i wish you two would not talk like that said aline because i have had exactly the same feeling and it is most uncanny but i cannot give up the new biggin people because of my feelings come let us have some fun she continued we look as if we had not a backbone among us she went to the sword chest as she spoke and took out a pair of foils now this will do my stiffness good and audrey can act as umpire they had a good deal of practice since the first encounter ian was really a brilliant master of the art and was much amused at the way that aline had completely hoaxed him aline made rapid progress and ian used to tell her that child as she was she would probably be able to account for a fairly average swordsman so little was the art then understood in scotland or england after a bout or two they sat down to rest you know said ian i think i ought to be leaving you soon i am ever so much better than i was and it would be well for me to be away why said audrey are you not comfortable here of course i am comfortable he said but i cannot stay here forever it would not be fair to you besides it is time that i was doing my work in the world but it would be terribly risky said audrey and after the narrow escape you had 
I think you might consider you had done your share. No, because I feel that I have something so valuable for people that it is worth any risk. But look how you have suffered, and you will bring the same suffering to others. In fact, you hesitated about telling us. But that was because you are children, and somehow I do not feel that a child is called upon to undertake such great responsibilities. I do not see why a child should not judge, said Aline. It is all so simple and beautiful. If it is worth dying for, people should be glad to have it, whatever the suffering. I think I feel ready to die, like poor George Wishart. So if your going helps other people, even if it makes us very sad, you must go. When do you think you ought to start? I have a definite errand to undertake. I have never told you about it, but I am acting as a special messenger with some important papers, and I have been thinking it over, and have come to the conclusion that I should be leaving here in a week at most, but less if possible. What, so soon? exclaimed both the children at once. A deeper gloom than ever seemed to fall over the party as this was said, and although they tried to feel cheerful, they knew it was a poor attempt. No one spoke for a long time. Ian sat with his head between his hands, and Aline gazed into the empty fireplace at the dead ashes of the fire that had been lit when Ian came. These days with Ian had made the Holwick life far more bearable for her. There were her Greek lessons and the fencing lessons, but bad as it would be to lose them, it would be worse to lose her friend. He was generally very reserved with her, but if she was in trouble, he always opened out. She glanced up. Ian had lifted his head and their eyes met. What would she do without him? Audrey held one of the foils and drew with it on the floor. The silence was oppressive. At length Aileen spoke. Where shall you go when you leave us? You cannot think how sadly we shall miss you. I shall probably miss you more than you will miss me, sweet child. And Menstrie looked at her with a strange longing pain in his heart. It was thirteen years since any one person had filled his life as this child had done and now he was to lose her. Surely, he said to himself, life is compact of most mysterious bitterness. But he tried to be cheerful for the child's sake, and said, Never mind, Aline, I shall come and see you again. I think I shall try and become a packman like your friend who gave you your necklace, if I can get some money somehow to begin, and then I can pay many visits to Holwick. I believe I could disguise myself well enough, as I do not think that anyone here really knows me. The few that saw me will have forgotten. We can meet in this room, and I shall be able to bring you news and some interesting things from far away. Yes, do bring me a chatelaine, said Audrey. I have always wanted one, and father has either forgotten or been unable to get it. Is there anything you would like, Burdine? said Ian, addressing Aline. Aline thought for a moment. Why should he bring her things? He was obviously poor, and never likely to be anything else. What was the younger son of a yeoman, who had been a wanderer, a smith, and a soldier of fortune, ever likely to have in the way of money? Even her own father, who had been a small laird, had never been able to purchase her the necklace that he had so desired to do. "'I do not want you to bring me anything,' she answered finally. "'If only you can keep yourself safe.' And then she added, hesitatingly, "'Would a Greek testament be expensive?' "'No, not at all,' said Ian. "'Would you like one, little angel?' "'Yes, very much, indeed. "'But, oh, I am afraid it will be a long time between one visit and the next, "'and we shall not know what has become of you.' "'And Aline sighed. "'I think I could write to you sometimes,' he said. "'We might get hold of Walter Margrove, who suggested something of the sort to you. "'And for greater security we could make duplicates of the parchment "'with the holes that you found in the book.' I could write the letter so that it looked like an announcement of my wares. They discussed the matter for some time, and the next day set about making the parchment slips, and for the following few evenings they were busy with several preparations. Ian's clothes all had to be mended and put in good order, and they took some of the clothes that they had found in the secret room, and by slight alterations were able to make him a second outfit. They also found a leathern wallet that with a little patching made a sound, serviceable article. Ian further made a suggestion to Aline, in case they should have reason to suspect that the key to their correspondence was known. "'Let us take your name and mine,' he said, to make the foundation of a series of letters, and we will write the names downward like this. 
yes and what next said aline well after each letter we will write in order the letters in the alphabet that follow it after a we will write b c d e f g and after l we will write m n o p q r and whenever we get to z we start the alphabet again so if we write our names it will look like this now there are twenty-five letters in each column and if we just put a number at the top of our communication we shall know where we are to begin to use the sequence i see said aline if the number is fifty-one we shall begin at the top of the third column if it is fifty-six we shall begin six letters down in the third column and if it was one hundred seventy-six said ian what should we do well we should have to make another column the same way and we should begin at the top of it now suppose the number is one we shall then begin at the very beginning and the way we should use the letters would be like this suppose this is the message arthur melland wishes to notify the good people in the lothians of the lasting excellence of his wares his pack is regularly filled with all the newest materials and too all is most marvellously finished in design our first letter was a and the first a we find is the a of arthur our second letter was l and the next l we find is in melland our third letter was i and the next i that we find is in wishes our fourth letter was n and the next n that we find is in notify oh that's quite easy said aline and so you mark them all like this arthur melland wishes to notify the good people in the lothians of the lasting excellence of his wares his pack is regularly filled with all the newest materials and too all is most marvellously finished in design and then cut them out yes said ian and the only other thing necessary is that the paper should first be neatly ruled with quarter-inch squares and each of the key letters carefully written in a square it does not matter about the others but then when the receiver gets the letter he knows that the squares to be cut must be exactly an even number of quarter inches from the edge of the page i hope i shall remember it if needful aline said i don't said audrey why not exclaimed the others in astonishment because i hope it won't be needed and that would certainly be simpler End of chapter thirteen Chapter Fourteen of the Child of the Moat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Trish E. Matson. Dub What's the Word Now. Blogspot.com. The Child of the Moat by Ian Bernard Stoughton Holborn. Chapter Fourteen. Goodbye. The days slipped by all too quickly, and the children spent every available moment in the secret room. But it was not very safe for them to disappear from sight too often, and moreover, other obligations had to be fulfilled. Sometimes they were able to arrange that one should remain with Ian, while the other was occupied elsewhere. On one of these occasions, while Audrey was in the secret room, Aline went down to the Arnsides. On the way, she met Father Lawrence, coming up from Middleton. It was an unusual thing for him to come to Holwick, and Aline was surprised. "'Good day, Father,' she said, as she dropped a curtsy. "'Bless you, my child,' said the old man, looking at her keenly. "'Talium enum est regnum dei,' he whispered softly to himself. "'How profound our Lord's sayings were!' yes it does one good even to look at a child and then he noticed that aline seemed sad and troubled and lacked her usual buoyant vivacity are you not happy little maiden he said gently aline looked at him with an expression of wonder no not exactly she said what is it my child oh many things father the world is difficult they had drawn near to the side of the road, and Aline was leaning against the wall. She plucked the top of a tall ragwort and began pulling off its yellow petals one by one. 
The priest put his elbow on the wall and looked down at her. He was very tall indeed, with a rather thin face and deep sad eyes. He at once saw that she did not want to tell him her troubles, and he had too much instinctive delicacy to press the child. He laid his disengaged hand kindly on her head, and she looked up at him. Strange, he thought. I might have had such a child of mine own, but no, it was not to be. Yes, I know what sorrow is. I have indeed made my sacrifice. All things work together for good, Aline, he said aloud. The forces of good must win in the end, but the powers of darkness are strong and the victory may be long delayed. Yet it will come. But the world is cruel, father, said Aline. Yes, my child, I know, and the world often seems to be victorious, but it is only victorious in the things of the world. The principle of love and the principle of beauty will outlast the world. And he smiled a sweet smile. Aline gazed into his face, and he seemed to be looking into the things beyond. Be of good courage, little maiden. Fear not them that have power to hurt the body. The Lord be with you, and may the Mother of God watch over you. Farewell. He turned as he spoke, and Eline saw him cross over to the cottage of Benjamin Darley. She went on to the Arnsides and found both mother and son at home. Ah, honey, said the old woman, it is good to see your bonny face. It's a sight for Sarah Eane. Mistress Eline is not looking very well, mother, said John. Nonsense, John, said Eline, and added brightly, I have come to ask you all you can tell me about Newbiggin. I know I can trust you. Dear heart, said Janet, you do us honor. She skillfully lifted the peats with the long tongs and rearranged them on a different part of the hearth and soon there was a bright fire that's a merry blaze said Eline. it seems to cheer one's heart for an hour they sat and talked about newbiggin and the child with what she already knew was able to make a shrewd estimate of the true state of affairs after a while the subject not unnaturally turned to Mall of the Graves, and Eline was dismayed when she heard that Mall had been talking about seeing a man on the moors and saying that it would be the beginning of troubles. What did she mean by that? asked Eline. She would not explain, said Janet. She refused to tell anyone anything more. The time is not yet. The time is not yet, she kept repeating. When all is ready and I have discovered the workings of the fates, I will tell you more than you wish to know. People have gossiped about it a great deal, Janet went on, but Moll will say nothing further. I trust that her evil desires may be foiled, said Eline, but I must not tarry. As she went up the street, she again met Father Lawrence, coming out of Peter's cottage, and he seemed more sorrowful than ever. Peace be with you, Eline he said. I have a right melancholic thing here, holding out a letter, but it cannot grieve thee beyond what thou already knowest. It is a letter from Durham, long delayed in transit, concerning the death of little Joan. Will you read it, or shall I? Helene's eyes filled with tears. I should like you to read it, she said. Father Lawrence then read, to Peter Simpson in Holwick. It beseemeth me to send thee word, although my heart is right heavy within me, of the passing of the small damsel eclept Joan, who came from Upper Teasdale. Of this you will have already heard, but my sister was herself sick of an ague at the time, and Sir Robert Miller, her confessor, saith that her mind wandered. He writeth this for me. She herself lingered not many days, God rest her soul, and when I came from Skipton, where I dwelled, she was buried. I only know from a neighbor that the damsel had gained health until latterly, and that the end was on a sudden, 
she spake much of the young lady at the hall who had given her great bounty and in especial would she have the shoon and the belt returned which were new but these same i cannot find and methinks they must have gone to newcastle with the other orphans who were in my sister's house and whom the good dame who came thence to nurse my sister took home in her charge and may our lady requite her kindness and thou wouldst speak to the mistress alice or ellen the name escapeth me i would give thee much thanks elizabeth perry but i never gave her any shoes or belt said aline poor little joan her mind must have failed her at the last or mistress perry must have been as much in error as she was about my name she was a dear child she continued and it is bitter dull to me i have burned a few candles for her soul but i have not much means trouble not thy gentle heart said the old priest i will myself say mass for the child and no one shall be at any charge god keep thee aline as he may when she reached the hall she went to ian and audrey and told them what she had learned and they were much disquieted at the evil speaking of old moll but there was nothing that they might do and they could only hope against hope ever since hearing the letter that father lawrence had read the sad figure of little joan had floated before aline's eyes and that night she went to the library and opened the ambury and took out the little packet and gazed at the pathetic contents i wonder whether i shall ever be able to find the boy wilfred johnston she said but i expect he will have forgotten already boys never remember long and then she recalled a remark of her father's a boy remembers longer and is more constant than a girl unless he has won her but after she is won she is the more faithful i should like to know if that be true she thought at length the evening came when ian had to start it was a fine bright night as the three made their way down the secret passage for the last time how strange it has all been said aline since we first discovered the secret room and this passage what a different thing life means to me from what it did then she was leading the way carrying the wallet containing the food while audrey carried a staff and a big heavy cloak it has been a wonderful time for me said ian and i can never realize to the full the marvellousness of my escape or your great kindness to me i feel that god must have arranged it all just because it is so strange i seem to have every little incident written in undying characters in my mind and i could recall almost every word of your conversations with me even if we never meet again you will live with me always oh but you will come back and we shall meet again audrey interrupted you must not talk like that i hope that i shall he said but the tone of his voice was so sad that no one spoke again till they came to the cave room they lifted the stone and ian climbed down first and then lifted the two through the opening as he held aline in his arms a great wave of feeling nearly overcame him altogether for the moment he felt as though he could not put her down it was like voluntarily parting with all that made life precious he clasped her tightly to him for a moment and then he set her very gently on her feet it was not too dark to see her face and as he looked at it he realized that he had never seen it more sad and yet it had never looked more beautiful the light was not bright enough to see the color but he could just discern something of its richness in the gleam of her thick long wavy hair reaching far down below her waist they all found it very difficult to speak and the children wished him a safe journey and a happy issue with very trembling voices think of me sometimes he said when i am gone and pray for me 
may God be with you and do more than I can ever ask in my feeble prayers. He kissed both the children, and holding Aline's little face in both his hands, he said, Oh, if I could only do something for you, little one, I could be happy, no matter what it cost. Somehow I feel that we shall never meet again in spite of what Audrey says. Still, that does not make it impossible for me to do something for you. Remember that I shall always be living in the hope that some such chance may come, and that the greatest pleasure you can give me is to let me use myself in your service. But now I must go. He kissed her once again, and then took the cloak, staff, and wallet, and strode into the darkness, which soon closed round him and hid him from their sight. After he had gone a hundred yards or so across the moor, he paused. It was almost more than he could bear. So he knelt down and prayed that all good things might come to Aline, and, if it were not selfish to ask it, that it might be given to him to suffer on her behalf. Some pain, some sacrifice, some physical or mental anguish, that might directly or indirectly add to her joy or lessen her sorrow. After this he felt strengthened and even elated at the thought of the suffering that he hoped would come. It was not enough to give her happiness. The more it would cost him, the more he would welcome it. He walked as fast as the light and the nature of the ground would permit, and when the morning dawned, he had passed the wild cataract of Cauldron Snout and was on the spurs of Knock Fell. End of chapter 14fifteen of the child of the moat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by phil chenevere the child of the moat by ian bernard stratton holborn chapter fifteen the terror of the mist it was a raw, damp morning, and the day struggled up with difficulty. Ian was very tired, as it was long since he had made any continuous physical effort, and, anxious as he was to make progress, he felt that he must rest. He sat down by a stream and opened his wallet and broke his fast, while he thought out what would be the best road for him to take. So far he had been sure of the way from Audrey's description, but he was a little more doubtful about his ability to find the route further on, and yet, if possible, he did not wish to ask questions of anyone he met. He was just able to distinguish the sun rising through the mist, and hoped that the day would brighten. From this he calculated that the wind, which was very steady, was from the northwest. He knew that, when they were hunting him before, a description of him had been sent as far as Alston and Kickuswald, so he determined to try and reach Carlisle without going through these places. In Carlisle people had more things to think about, and the incident of his escape, even if news of it had travelled so far, would by this time be forgotten. Moreover, a stranger in the great border town would not arouse any curiosity. He therefore decided that he would keep along by the highest ground following the ridge of summits. This, he knew, would ultimately bring him to Cold Fell, where the drop on every side is very marked and whence, if he had not seen Carlisle itself before, he could drop down by Neworth or Brampton. After a long rest he turned up the steep. Unfortunately the mist, instead of lifting, grew thicker until he had nothing to guide him but the wind and the general lie of the ground. Used as he was to the hills, he always felt the eeriness of the mist, seething and curling and scurrying over the heather. It was bitterly cold, as the wind was strong and the mist grew so thick that he could only see the ground for a few paces. He was afraid of coming suddenly upon the precipice of some quarry or cross-gully. He had heard, too, of the terrible potholes in the limestone district, 
and pictured himself falling down into one of those black bottomless chimneys where even his body would never be seen again he decided to strike straight up for the top even though it was more fatiguing and he followed the steepest line of the ground scrambling over the rocks where necessary he started violently as he suddenly heard the scream of an eagle somewhere near him in the mist and later on he was surprised actually to come upon one tearing the body of a grouse the great bird rose and hit him whether intentionally or not he was not sure but he shrank involuntarily and the sight of the small mangled victim stirred his heart why was the world of birds and men so essentially cruel poor little aline he thought as he looked at the little bird when at last he reached the height he was met by an icy wind of tremendous force from the weather side of the hill and it was only with extreme difficulty that he could keep his footing using the wind as his guide he decided on a place where the gradient was less and the direction right as far as he could judge and trusted that this would be the call between the summits it was anxious work and at last he began to feel that he had descended too far he had missed the call he was lost although better in health his nerves were still shaken for a moment he half broke down oh if i could only see you once again aline he cried and you will never know that months afterwards the shepherds found the remains of an unknown man upon the hills he peered into the mist as though by strength of will he could force its secret it was vain the mist was blankly impenetrable under ordinary circumstances he was too good a hillsman to mind and would simply worse come to worse have followed downstream till he came to the haunts of men but it was a matter of life and death to him now not to come down the wrong valley moreover there were the precious papers for which he had already risked so much gradually he recovered but what was he to do which side had he gone wrong he stood and reflected for a moment the direction of the wind seemed all right but it was very much less in force surely then he was to the east of the call oh if only the mist would lift but it still raced past with its white swirling cruel fingers the wind sighed sadly in the rank tall tinted grass and away below he heard the falling of many waters and the endless bleating of sheep every now and then some gigantic menacing forms would seem to shape themselves out of the mist they danced round him they pointed at him they mocked him they were troll they were the spirits of death the lost souls of the sons of men a brooding horror seemed to sweep over the desolate hillside chilling him with a nameless dread he turned a little further into the wind and the ground grew more wet and mossy this must surely be somewhere below the middle of the call he argued and he struck still more to the left suddenly he came upon a sight that froze his marrow it was the skeleton of a child some poor little wanderer who like himself had been lost and who never had returned home the wind whistled through the small slender bones they were quite clean save for a little hair clinging to the skull from which ian guessed that it was a boy he might have been ten or twelve years old how had he come there what had brought him to his fate the clothes had entirely gone save for one little shoe ian picked it up looked at it and shivered oh the horror of it then the mood changed and he found himself filled with unutterable pity poor child poor child he said another victim of a heartless world he knelt down and laid his hand on the small skull and his emotion overcame him then he gathered the bones together and carried them to a small hollow under a great rock 
as he was doing this his fingers came across something in the grass it was a small wallet or purse when he had taken all the bones he managed with some difficulty to cover them with earth and then he built up a little corn of stones the small shoe he put with the bones but the wallet he took with him with very mingled feelings he struggled up the slope and at last to his great relief he felt the icy blast of the northwest wind with the ground sloping upward in the right direction he decided to make for the very summit the better to check his position and at last he reached the point and then cautiously made his way in the same manner to what he believed was cross fell it was very slow work and the ground was very wet and heavy he was footsore and stiff from lack of practice and when the evening began to close in he had made absurdly little headway at last he felt he could go no further and must spend the night upon the hills he climbed over the ridge to the leeward side and dropped until he came to the heather line where he found a dry hollow between some rocks tearing up a quantity of heather he made himself a bed to lie on and sat down on the soft extemporized couch then he opened the little wallet or pouch that he had found by the skeleton it contained some knuckle bones and a piece of cord but with them was a wonderful bracelet of peculiar workmanship i judged it to be celtic of a very remote date as it somewhat resembled work that a friend had found in the Culbin sands an inscription and other alterations had been made at a later date the design was in bold curving shapes that expressed the very spirit of metal most remarkable were three large bosses of a strange stone of marvelous hue they were a deep sky blue brilliantly clear and transparent but with a slight yet most mysterious opalescence in the color he had never heard of such a stone and there was something almost uncanny about the way they shone in the dim light whether they were original or substitutes for enamel or amber he could not tell the inscription ran woe to who stealeth me peace to who findeth me but weal where i come as a gift of love it was a marvelously beautiful thing and ian could not help speculating how the boy had come by it if these charms and amulets really had any power he might well have stolen it he thought shuddering at what he had seen but that is a thing we shall never know however it would be a pleasing gift for aline and some day i will clasp it myself on that little white wrist he pictured aline to himself wearing the bracelet and then rolling his cloak about him went to sleep for a few hours he slept well and then he woke with the cold he was very tired and sleepy but unable to sleep again for the pains which shot through him the miserable night seemed endless he tossed and dozed and tossed again but at last the dawn broke it was still misty but he was anxious to get on he opened his wallet and found it was getting low there was enough for two fair meals but he divided it into three portions and took one the wind had dropped but he had taken the precaution of marking its direction on the ground before he slept however that would not avail him long he wondered what aline was doing he was sure that somehow providence had intended him to help her suppose he had done wrongly and should meet his death and deprive her of his aid ah why was life so continually perplexing when he started to move his swollen blistered feet made every step painful but gradually he became more used to it and struggled on mechanically he was going very slowly although it was downhill and it was with joy that in rather less than four hours he came across a mountain track running according to his guess east and west this must surely be the road from ulston to kikoswald he said and feeling more or less reassured he sat down 
he was so worn out from fatigue and lack of sleep that he almost at once fell into a deep slumber when he awoke he found a shepherd boy looking at him you sleep soundly master he said whither are you bound i am going to carlisle he answered i have been to carlisle once said the boy it's a fine town with bonny sights but that was not yesterday i spend all my time with the sheep and it is rarely that i get a chance for such things no it's not much pleasure that they let come my way he added dolefully ian looked at the boy who had a fine face and was well proportioned in length of limbs and figure but thin and ill-nourished with hollow cheeks and angular shoulders i am afraid they do not feed you over well he remarked <laughs> not they said the lad i get my bros in the morning and none too much of that and then generally i get some more bros in the evening do you get nothing all day asked ian why no he replied would you like something to eat now the boy's eyes lit up as ian undid his wallet surely he said ian gave him all that the wallet contained and smiled with pleasure as he watched the boy ravenously devour every morsel it was the first glow of satisfaction that ian had had since he left hulwick as the boy munched away ian thought he might get what information he could at least he would know how much more road there was before him which was advisable now that he had nothing whatever left to eat do you know the names of the hills he asked casually as though hunting for a topic of conversation why of course said the boy black fellas up that way and cross fellas over there if it was a clear day you could see the hills in the west too skiddaw and blinkathara and helvwyn and all the rest of them i wish i was going with you to carlisle he added somewhat wistfully a city is better than the hills not that i do not love the hills he continued but an apprentice gets more to fill his stomach than the shepherd lad leastways than one who has no father and mother and who works for former harrington ian's heart always went out to children and this gaunt but rather handsome boy interested him not a little how old are you he asked and what is your name my name is wilfred johnstone and i shall be twelve come martinmas would you like to be apprenticed in the city and do you know anything about it that should i he answered i should like to be a carpenter like johnny o the biggins whom they sent to thrisk last year some day he will be a master carpenter and be building roofs and houses and sick like bonny things but wilfred what would farmer harrington say if you left him well i cannot tell but he would not have cause to say much for the way that he treats the men and the lads that work for him i very nearly left him and tramped into carlisle last week but it's hard to become an apprentice if you cannot pay your footing ian had two or three gold pieces left so he took out one and gave it to the boy that will enable you to get to carlisle and back again if need be and stay a while anyway to see if you can find a place i might be able to help you if you can find me see the sheep are all right tonight and then come along i shall be about the market cross most days at noon and if you do not find me the money will take you back the boy's eyes grew round with astonishment he took the money and tried incoherently to express his thanks and then after a pause he asked what's your name oh call me james mitchell but look you ian added do not tell a soul about meeting me or ask for me by name in carlisle i cannot help you if you do promise me the boy looked ian squarely in the face and held out his hand i promise he said ian grasped the hand and felt the magnetism of a mutual understanding the boy was clearly honest and true and would keep to his word well good-bye and god be with you said ian and turned away northward after they parted ian kept along in the same manner as before and to his great gladness the mist toward evening began to lift but he was faint and famished and felt weak from want of food 
The sleep had done him some good, but he had slept too long and lost most of the day. He felt a little less melancholy after he had seen the boy, but he was still very depressed. His mind ran on old Moll and her talk about the spirits of darkness. Consequently, it was a distinct shock when he caught sight of a gigantic figure looming through the mist and striding along a little below him as though seeking a place so as to come up to his level. It was many times larger than himself, and in the dim curlings of the mist had a most terrifying aspect. Eying began to run, but the figure started running also. At last he stood still, and the figure stopped and turned towards him. For a moment his brain, dizzy with hunger, contemplated a fight with this supernatural being. He mechanically grasped his staff and raised it, and the figure did the same. Then the tension relaxed and Ian laughed. It was the Brocken, the strange specter of the hills formed by the distorted shadow of his own figure on the mist. In all his hill traveling this was the first time that he had ever seen it and although he laughed, the little incident had not helped to steady his nerves. It has, however, one advantage, he said. I now know my direction from the position of the sun. Then suddenly the mist broke, and there before him was revealed a glorious view. The sun was setting in a crimson glory, and the hills of Cumberland, still cloud-capped, were flushed with delicate colors. He was below Blacklaw Hill, and cold fell blocked the view to the north. Immediately in front was the great plain of Carlisle, and beyond that the waters of the Solway. Far on the left a silver glitter showed the position of Ulswater. It was radiantly beautiful, and the more so, because of the contrast with the cold and darkness of the mist. He decided that on the whole he had better keep to the hills, but it grew dark, and he had to spend another cheerless night on the high ground, which was made worse by the gnawing hunger, but somehow his spirit seemed brighter, and in spite of the cold and pain he did not feel so unhappy. When the morning broke, he set off with a light heart to Brampton, where he secured food without being asked any question, and in the evening he found himself in Carlisle. End of chapter 15Chapter Sixteen of the Child of the Moat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Child of the Moat by Ian Bernard Stoughton Holborn. Chapter Sixteen A Desperate Task. When Ian reached Carlisle, he secured himself a room at the old hostelry near the cathedral, sent a message into Scotland that he had arrived, and then spent some days in general inquiries as to the possibility of getting work. In this he was not very successful, but was more so in the case of Wilfred Johnstone, whom on the fourth day of his arrival he met at the Market Cross. Ian was sitting watching the people when the boy came up. He had a stick over his shoulder with a small bundle containing his belongings. "'How long have you been, Carlyle? asked Ian. "'I have only just arrived,' said the boy. "'Come along, then. We must see what we can do for you. I suppose there is no likelihood of Farmer Harrington coming to look for you.' "'I do not know.' said the boy and i do not know whether he could compel me to come back but he might i am an orphan and all my folk are dead i lived with my aunt louisa johnstone until she died this winter she had no children of her own then she was really only your uncle's wife no she was my mother's sister my name is not really johnstone but i was always called that because i lived with her what was your father's name then it was ackroyd 
so your real name is wilfred ackroyd yes then we can call you will ackroyd or willie ackroyd and if farmer harrington comes asking for wilfred johnstone he won't find him you are right master come along then will i have found a carpenter called matthew musgrave who is actually in need of a lad so i think we can settle that difficulty matthew musgrave was a good-hearted fellow who took kindly to the boy and the arrangement was concluded the result was that he also began to take an interest in the stranger who had introduced him with the final issue that james mitchell as we must now call ian who was remarkably clever with his hands used to go round to help matthew when he was extra busy and gradually matthew found him so useful that he gave him more or less regular employment he had decided to keep to the name of james mitchell which was the name he had used on the continent when he fled from england not long after mary's ascension even his friends in france did not know his real name if ever he should return to his own country he would resume it meanwhile james mitchell did well enough moreover his recent captors knew him by his real name and it might be some slight safeguard he smiled as he remembered how he had instinctively given the children his own name it had seemed the natural thing to do after about a week erskine arrived and he was accompanied by mortoon himself who hoped to obtain further personal information by word of mouth beyond that contained in the documents i hear you have had some sore delays james mitchell he said yes my lord i was imprisoned for some time in york and wounded and sick and in hiding for over two months you are a scot i understand i am my lord and of the reformed faith that is so we shall need the services of all good scots if there is any fighting to be done can we rely upon you by my troth you may my lord i shall be found here ian then put the shoes on the table and they ripped them open the contents were practically uninjured and they talked till late into the night as they retired to rest erskine remarked master knox has found a good servant in you james mitchell i am glad to have met an honest man with an honest heart ay and an honest face he added good night the next morning they left early and ian felt that an epoch in his life had closed he also not unnaturally thought that having reached carlisle in safety and found employment his adventures were for the time at an end but instead of that they were only just beginning although wilfred had obtained his wish he was obviously restless and unhappy on several occasions ian had tried to get at the reason but the boy was uncommunicative at last he admitted that it was because he had left something behind at master harrington's near kirkoswald i think i shall go over and get it he said but that would hardly be safe ian objected master harrington might not let you have it or let you go again it is not in a house said wilfred it is hidden in a tree i could find it easily in the dark how did you come to forget it asked ian i did not exactly forget it but i had to slip away in a hurry and did not dare to go back besides i thought i might have to return to kirkoswald in any case and perhaps it was as safe there as anywhere i knew it would be possible to go and fetch it and i must go now i cannot but think you are very unwise will but you do not know what it means to me said the boy ian respected the child's secret and asked no further well i shall be very anxious until you come back you cannot do it in a day 
where will you sleep it is getting late in the year oh i shall manage somehow said the boy i shall start to-morrow forenoon wednesday and shall be back on thursday soon afternoon then if you are not back i shall be very nervous about you and shall come after you no do not do that master i shall be all right ian was not satisfied but he let the boy set off early the following morning wilfred trudged away along the road without mishap resting now and then and taking it easily as he did not want to arrive before dusk a little after sunset he arrived at the outskirts of the farm and made his way cautiously to the hollow tree he looked round carefully but no one was about he then crept into the tree and felt in the corner for a pile of stones in this was concealed a small wooden box he took out the box and drew from it a packet wrapped in oiled canvas within this was another with the open edges thickly smeared with tallow he took that off also and within was another piece of oiled canvas but the packet was now small enough to go into his pouch where he put it without opening it it would be too dark to see it he said to himself i think i shall sleep here it is as good as anywhere he waited until he was certain that no one was about and came out from the tree to gather leaves with which to make a bed and then he lay down excitement and cold however kept him awake for hours and it was not till far on in the night that he fell asleep when he awoke it was broad day although still early i have slept too long he thought it was a pity i did not fall asleep earlier he peeped out and there was nobody in sight so he softly stole away toward the road but he had not gone fifty yards before the thundering voice of the reeve his particular enemy called out hello there i see you sneaking round you young thief but you will not hide from us again i'll warrant the reeve started running and wilfred took to his heels the reeve was a powerful athletic fellow but wilfred was light and nimble he dodged under a fence that the reeve had some difficulty in surmounting and in that way gained a little at the start for a time the distance between them did not alter both were holding themselves in reserve then it occurred to wilfred to turn uphill he might not be so strong but his wind would be better the reeve puffed and panted after the boy who steadily increased his lead when wilfred reached the top of the slope he glanced round the reeve was far behind then he plunged down the hill where there was a burn at the bottom and splashed through it with some difficulty as the water was up to his waist and the bank on the other side was steep the reeve gained during the process and being taller made light work of the burn and was close behind terror lent wings to the boy's feet but the reeve slowly overhauled him and could almost reach him with his arm wilfred could hear his loud breathing just behind him when the reeve tripping over a root not only fell headlong but rolled into a ditch wilfred laughed and fled like the wind there was a thick wood not a hundred yards away and he would be safe his adversary picked himself up and was just in time to see wilfred approaching the wood he could easily have escaped but another man appeared coming out of the wood at the same moment catch him joseph yelled the reeve and the exhausted boy fell an easy prey to the newcomer 
the reeve was considerably hurt by his fall and it greatly increased his anger where have you been you young rascal he roared and what have you done with the sheep you stole i never stole a sheep said wilfred indignantly and it is no business of yours where i have been oh isn't it we'll soon see about that do you know what happens to boys who steal sheep said the reeve vindictively wilfred was silent come now what happens to boys who steal sheep he went on with malicious glee wilfred was still silent you need not be so proud come answer my question and taking the boy's arm he twisted it round till the tears stood in his eyes but he restrained himself from crying out what happens to boys who steal sheep they are hanged said wilfred at last but i have not stolen sheep or anything he said doggedly you can say what you like but the sheep disappeared and you disappeared and here you are sneaking round in the early morning the case is as good as proved and the bullying ruffian kicked the boy brutally the two men led him along to the old grange and locked him up in a small room high up near the roof wilfred knew that the reeve had spoken truly young lads with no friends were not of much account and nothing but a miracle could save him he sat there for hours as it were dazed and stunned and then toward evening he opened his pouch and took out the little packet and unfastened it it contained half a groat and a long lock of hair oh joan he said i wonder what will become of you when i am gone i wonder if any one will ever tell you what happened to me master mitchell was quite right i should not have come back no even for your sake it was better not to come for now i have lost everything everything and there was i going to become a carpenter and lay by a plenty of money and come and marry you when i was big they say a boy can't love he said bitterly they know nothing about it i do not suppose they know what love is if only i were dying for you joan i should be quite happy but to die for what i have not done he threw himself on the floor and sobbed and sobbed until from the sheer physical exhaustion of the paroxysms of grief he fell asleep meanwhile ian was anxiously awaiting his return the strange feeling that had possessed him ever since the day that aline had talked about it in the secret room and that lately had been somewhat less intense came back stronger than ever he could not explain it he could not reason about it he only knew that something terrible was in the air and that it did not only affect wilfred or himself so strong was the feeling that he did not wait till the next morning he merely lay down for a few hours and set off soon after midnight so as to reach kirkoswald at dawn it was one of the last places where he wished to be seen but he seemed to be drawn by fate he had grown a beard while at holwick and he further disguised himself before starting by pulling out half his eyebrows which were thick and bushy and likewise the hair above his forehead for the space of half an inch no one would be able to recognize me who did not actually know me he said i certainly do not answer to any description of myself that can have been sent around he went to the different hostels and gossiped with every one he could not ask questions at all direct as that would have raised suspicion he began to despair but at last his patience was rewarded 
by good luck his informant was a young farmhand who had been friendly with wilfred and whose sympathies were strongly on his side like every one else so he told ian he was certain that wilfred had committed the theft and equally certain that he would be hanged but in a guarded way he let it be seen that he strongly disapproved of such extremities yes he said they will never take him out of that little top room except to his trial and death ian longed to ask where the top room was but felt it would be too risky when the young fellow rose to leave the hostel ian strolled out i may as well stretch my legs he said he had turned the conversation to other subjects but as he had hoped they passed the grange and he looked up and remarked casually i suppose that's where the boy is of whom you spoke yes said his companion in the second window from the left or the right he managed to say unconcernedly it's strange what scenes may be going on behind a wall and no one know from the left said his companion the one with the dripstone half off poor boy ian said how foolish to risk one's life though for a sheep but other people's doings are always inexplicable where did you say you lived yourself he went on a quarter of a mile down the path where the oaks are those are good trees there must be some timber worth having ian did not return to the subject of wilfred and he parted from the youth as they neared his cottage he strolled back to the grange it seemed a fairly hopeless case ladders would be impossible without an accomplice moreover there was a moat that ran around two sides of the house and the window was over the moat could he try and save the boy by his own evidence no that was useless it might be of little avail in any case and as he himself was a suspected fugitive it would more probably destroy any slender chance that there might be he did not dare to linger but he cautiously inspected the situation and saw a desperate chance away on the far side was a tall elm tree whose branches came very near the battlement the tree itself was unclimbable but another tree whose branches actually touched the first one seemed to offer an opportunity it was that or nothing a very long rope was clearly necessary and how to get that without exciting suspicion was indeed a problem ian secured a room in the principal hostel and looked round the stable yard gossiping with the ostlers when no one was there he found a short length of stout rope but it was not enough at last he bethought him of his bed and on examining it he found that the rope carried across and across under the mattress was nearly new this would mean that he would have to come back to the hostel but as he had purposely obtained a room on the ground floor so as to be able to slip out easily that presented little difficulty it was a dark night and rain was falling slightly he undid the rope from the bed which was in two lengths and spliced them and the other rope together as he set out his heart smote him the risk was immense if he were caught it was more than likely he would be hanged if he escaped that there was a very considerable chance of being recognized as the escaped heretic and then he would be burnt but even without being caught the operation itself was so dangerous that it was as like as not that he would break his neck was he justified in risking his life when aline's necessities might require him there certainly seemed no other chance for the boy he had thought of all the obvious possibilities of saving him but every case was barred by an insuperable objection less obvious perhaps but fatal nevertheless why am i made so that i always see both sides so clearly he said 
other people have no such difficulties in making up their minds it did not occur to ian that even the difficulty would probably have presented itself to another man in a different way ian's problem was merely when and for whom to risk his life some of us might hesitate before risking our lives at all however after pondering for a while it suddenly occurred to him that aline would wish it that settled it the two problems disappeared there was only one problem and that was to act as carefully as possible aline would undoubtedly counsel that much he crept along very quietly it was almost too dark every twig that cracked every slight stumble that he made caused his heart to beat violently once he started a dog barking and had to remain motionless for a long time but the most trying experience was that when he had cautiously stolen very near to the grange a figure on horseback rode up and passed within a yard of him he stepped behind a tree and saw the door opened a flood of light streamed out and before he could get on the further side of the tree again he felt he must be seen once more he waited a long time till all was dark and quiet he climbed the first tree with less difficulty than he expected but the branches of the two trees were further apart than he had thought finally he had to go up higher and lay the rope over a branch and lower himself holding the two ends and then after reaching the other tree pull the rope over the branch by one end the rain and the darkness made discovery less likely but everything was slippery and the difficulties were greatly increased having climbed up higher he started along one branch but after he had reached the furthest safe point he found that he was still a long way from the wall again he tried a second branch but although a little nearer it was an awful gulf in the black night a third time he crept slowly along another slippery branch that swayed and bent under his weight suppose the whole thing should break elm trees are notoriously treacherous he thought the branch was worse than the second and he had to go back to that one this time he managed to wriggle out a couple of feet further where the branch gave a sudden turn upward and to the left parallel to the face of the wall he could dimly discern the top of the parapet on a slightly lower level perhaps six feet distant he tied a heavy knot in the rope and swung it out to hit the stonework so as to measure the distance it was perhaps rather under than over seven feet but a seven-foot jump from a wet swaying branch with a forty-foot drop in the pitch darkness was a fearsome task the thought made him feel quite sick and the nausea made his brain reel a slight squall of wind blew up and the branch rocked and creaked ominously he had to hold on with all his strength where he would have fallen when he had recovered himself a little a thought struck him he would double the rope and loop it round the branch and then tie the ends firmly about him under the armpits the rope was not very strong but surely if doubled there was just a chance of it standing a sudden jerk after he had done this he nerved himself for the last effort but before standing up he prayed for aline passionately fervently as though the intensity of his prayer should ensure its answer he then rose and balancing himself with difficulty leaped across he reached the parapet but it was wet while the lichens on it made it like glass and he slipped down 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 into the void he heard a laugh as of a fiend and saw aline's face blanched with pity there was an awful wrench under his arms and a snap above 
one of the thicknesses of rope had broken but he was still alive he climbed hand over hand feverishly without pausing an instant up the slimy rope and then held on to the branch while wave after wave of uncontrollable terror swept over him his excitement was so violent that he feared he would lose his reason he used all his will power to bring it under control but he could not do it must he abandon the attempt could he ever force himself there in the horrible yawning blackness to go through with it again his teeth chattered and do what he would his hands shook till he nearly fell again then he thought of aline and saw her swimming the river while he rested his wounded arm upon her shoulder coward he hissed through his teeth coward but oh aline if only it were for you it is for her though you do not see how said a voice within gradually he grew calmer so that by a supreme effort he forced himself to tie the broken rope and again stand up he stooped over to the left where the branch turned and holding on with both hands he kicked the branch till he broke the bark a little and roughened it then he raised himself upright and putting every ounce of strength and will into the leap he cleared the space and landed in a crenellation he fell and hurt himself considerably but what did that matter untying the rope from himself he slipped it from the tree and cautiously made his way round the parapet he had to climb three gables and there were other difficulties but at last he was over wilfred's window he slipped the rope round a merlon footnote the merlons are the projecting upright portions of a battlement End of footnote. and climbed down and knocked at the window the boy who was sleeping a light nervous sleep woke at once and luckily had the good sense to make no noise clearly any one at the window was a friend enemies came to the door he rose and went to the window and opened it great mercy master mitchell is that you hush yes said ian and stepped into the room he pulled down the rope by one end and before doing anything else properly spliced the broken piece lest it should catch they then set the bed a trifle nearer to the window and looped the rope round the bedpost can you swim willie said ian no master that is very serious he said as this rope will not stand both of us and it is so dark that i cannot first lower you till you just reach the water but i can climb well said the boy that is all right then but remember the rope is very wet ian tied the two ends together and lowered them slowly till the rope hung looped at its middle point round the bedpost now as you cannot swim i must go first i only hope the rope is long enough it cannot be more than a few feet short anyway and worse come to the worst you must take a long breath and drop into the water but before letting go when your legs are dangling grip one end of the rope and hold it cut the rope above and the other end will fly up and we can pull it through i want to leave no evidence ian gave him a knife and then climbed out and gently let himself noiselessly down the rope he found that the ends hung about two and a half feet above the water just beyond a swimmer's reach wilfred then followed full of apprehension when near the bottom ian whispered hold on but let your feet down into the water as the boy's feet reached the moat ian trod water and put his arms up to him this reassured him as the child who could not swim naturally shrank from the plunge into the black deeps in the specially trying surroundings cut the rope hold the knotted end tight and let go 
said ian as the boy dropped he caught him and by going under himself prevented the boy from being completely submerged give me the rope and ian pulled down a long length so as to swim over hold on to me and he swam across just as they reached the bank the short end ran up suddenly and the whole rope fell with a loud splash the two fugitives waited fearfully lest it should raise the alarm but nothing further broke the silence of the night as they walked dripping to the hostel ian said i wish you were not wet but who would have thought of this what shall we do they climbed through the window and wilfred shivered violently partly with cold and partly with excitement i shall leave the bed on the floor ian said come let us get off your clothes he stripped the boy rubbed him down with a dry towel and put him into bed the friction started a warm glow and he was soon all right wilfred asked for his precious packet and while ian was busy wringing out their clothes he opened it and dried the contents and put it under his pillow at four o'clock ian woke him i am so sorry about the wet things but you must make for carlisle at once as best you may never mind i am warm again now and used often to be wet through all day when i was with the sheep after wilfred had gone ian replaced both ropes and put the bed right he stayed in kirkoswald till nearly evening so as not to attract attention and for the same reason went on to penrith and returned by the other road to carlisle the following day he overheard a little of the gossip about the boy's escape the most popular belief was that he had flown out of the window with the devil those who prided himself on their superior intellects said that some one had obviously opened the door and hidden him in their house just as they had clearly done at his first disappearance an orphan boy however was not of much value one way or the other and the thing as a practical question was a nine days wonder although a favourite topic of gossip relating to things mysterious for many a long day End of chapter 16chapter 17 of the child of the moat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jennifer whisk the child of the moat by ann bernard stoughton holborn chapter 17 carlyle luckily matthew musgrave who had given wilfred permission to go asked no questions beyond inquiring whether he had settled things to his satisfaction i had some difficulties said wilfred but everything's all right now wilfred lodged with musgrave but they would often both come round to the hostelry where anne was on one of these occasions a number of men were seated round the fire with tankards of ale when a big burly fellow came in and asked mine host to draw him a tankard catching sight of matthew he went up to him and clapping him on the back he asked how things were going well enough thank you andrew and how is all with you now that you have settled down near the old place again oh not so badly it is harder work than at holwick but it's good being near one's own folk ian started slightly at the name of holwick but no one noticed and he guessed that this must be andrew woolridge he waited a moment and then cautiously entered the conversation where is holwick he questioned it's not very far south from here said andrew on the tees a few miles from middleton what were you doing there asked ian oh i was working at holwick hall master richard mowbray's place what sort of place was that a fine big place but they had not the money that the family used to have what were they like inquired ian yes tell us something about them said matthew you have never told us much oh they were all right master mowbray was excellent and so were the young mistresses but mistress mowbray herself was a tartar was that why you left asked little wilfred well no not exactly said andrew i had a bit of a quarrel with them these things will happen you know and he laughed 
in fact now that i think it over i believe they were in the right they were decent people but queer in some ways and so i thought i had better shift over here what was the quarrel about asked matthew oh that is too long a story but i thought they should supply me with enough corn for the winter and they were not willing maybe i wanted too much anyhow i came away but i'm sorry sometimes too why said anne well if you must know i was sorry for the little mistress eileen gillespie who lived with them she and i did not get on very well but mistress mowbray treated her like a dog mistress eileen though did me a good turn once when i got into trouble and somehow i would have liked to do her a good turn too by way of paying back i do not like being in any one's debt but there i make my mistakes like the rest of us what do i owe you he said turning to the innkeeper it's time i was going hello andrew said the newcomer whither away in such haste come back man and then he added something in a low voice in which anne distinctly caught the word holwick this was a strange coincidence anne thought to meet two people within a few minutes who both knew holwick and he wondered who the newcomer might be he had not long to wait the stranger turned to the innkeeper and said timothy man i'm back again you've got a place for my pack horses for the night i hope there's always room for old friends said the innkeeper is there anything you'll be buying yourself asked the stranger faith man but i've got some fine things but you're getting that set up in carlisle that a man who only brings goods from flanders and italy and persia and india to say nothing of the latest novelties from london is hardly likely to please you but i've got some rugs now that would just stir your heart you never saw the like i have just refused three hundred florins for one of them but i'll let an old friend have it for that price oh stop your gammon walter said the innkeeper you need not tell me your tales if there's anything good and cheap i may take it but i do not want any of your flowery word fancies odds bodikins mine host is very plain spoken rejoined walter but come along sirs what do you want addressing the little group and he unrolled a bundle as he spoke although walter made the most of them his wares really were thoroughly good stuff and he had a happy taste in making his selections consequently he always did good business wherever he went and it was rumored that he had a pretty pile laid by for a rainy day he sold a few things to those present and was rolling up the bundle when anne caught sight of a singularly beautiful silver buckle of admirable design and workmanship it was of a superior class to most of the trinkets that the pack man had with him he said nothing at the time but waited for a more favorable opportunity as the pack man was staying for the night in the evening anne and the pack man were seated alone at the fire anne looked around carefully the door was shut so he decided that he might broach the subject of holwick i suppose you travel far he said yes master mitchell i cover the length of the country once every year but i work mainly in the north between here and york are you going to york now well i expect to do after a time but i am going to hexham and newcastle and durham and shall then work my way up the ware and down the tees and probably up wensleydale do you know upper teesdale why yes but it's an out-of-the-way place yet do you know many of these out-of-the-way places are my best customers when i was last there i sold a large quantity to master richard mowbray of holwick hall you know them then in a business way yes said walter there's a little girl that is living there that i know slightly said anne what mistress eileen gillespie the bonniest child i ever saw in my life i shall never forget that child although i have only seen her once said jeff man she has the face of an angel and the soul of one too beshrew me if she has not well she comes from my country although i cannot say that i have any extended acquaintance with her any more than you have i am sorry for that baron said walter lowering his voice and looking round she has none too happy a time with the mowbrays but there it may be gossip he continued as the thought occurred to him that he was not sure of his listener one hears such funny tales as one goes about the country one does not know what to believe you are going that way again then said anne 
Yes, yes, and perchance if you know the child, you would like me to tell her that I had seen you. Maybe so, and I might send her one of your trinkets. I saw a little buckle that might take her fancy. Walter got up and fetched the bundle and produced the buckle. Honestly, man, he said, that is a more expensive class of thing than most of my stuff, but I will let you have it cheap. Yes, really cheap. I know you think I always talk like that, but I swear I am speaking true. There was an earnestness in the man's tone and manner that was quite unlike his usual jaunty way of talking, and Anne felt he might venture to say more. I believe you, he said. Well, I will buy it and send a letter with it, but promise me that no one else shall see you give it to her. You know the old cat too, then, do you? said Margrove, a little off his guard. Mistress Mowbray, you mean, said Anne. Well, I know about her, and in these days, Lee said, as soon as men did. Yes, we dwell in strange times, the packman responded. The land has passed through sad experiences, and then, fearing he might have said too much, he added, Maybe it is all right, but I have no fancy to see human flesh fry. Nor I either, said Anne. I saw them burn George Wishart, and I shall not forget that on this side of my grave. It's my belief, said Walter, that the church does itself more harm than good by the burnings. It does not have the effect that they expect. I believe your sympathy is with those who are burned, said Anne, looking at him keenly. Maybe it is, and maybe it isn't. But anyway, I say that Mother Church does not always see where her own interests lie. But my business is chaffering, and I do not meddle in these matters to you there. Tut, tut, man. You need not mind me. Say what you like. I care for the burning no more than you do, and no finger of mine would ever be stirred to get a man into trouble. Well, neighbor, said Margrove, you speak fair. Neither would I. If George Wishart had come to me, I should not have told them where to find him. Then keep my secret, said Anne, and give Mistress Eileen the buckle without a soul knowing it. While I'm about it, he added, I will take the chatelaine, and that will do for the other little mistress. Then it was not only in Scotland that you knew Mistress Eileen, remarked Walter, looking at him shrewdly. Anne was half sorry that he had said so much. He might have enclosed the chatelaine for Audrey without telling Walter Margrove, but he said offhandedly, The Gillespies lived in Scotland but we're cousins of Richard Mowbray. I have never seen him, but I know he has a daughter. Aye, he has a daughter, and she would be worth going some way to see, too. Only she is outshone by her cousin. But Mistress Audrey is a bonny lassicky, and will make a fine woman. Yet it's a pity the Mowbrays have no boy. It's a sad thing for the family to die out. Both men were silent for a time, and then Margrove spoke. He looked at Anne questioningly. I believe I have seen your face before, he said. Your name's not James Mitchell. He gave the fire a stir, and as the flame shot up, he said, Were you ever at Northampton? I was, said Anne. Then you are the man to whom I owe everything. Why did I not recognize you before? I have heard they had seized you, and I heard afterwards that you had escaped to France. See this? He went on drawing a small copy of the New Testament from his doublet. I have not the courage to go about as you do, but I too have done a little, and if need be, I hope I shall have strength not to deny the faith. There was silence again. This time Anne spoke. I wonder if you know where a Greek testament could be obtained. You travel much and see many things. It is strange that you should say that. I have two concealed in an inner pouch in my pack that have come over from Amsterdam, and I was taking them to Master Shipley, near York, who had asked me to obtain one for him. Then you will let me have the better one and take it along with the buckle? Is that it, then? said Margrove. Poor child, poor child. No, said Anne, you are wrong. They do not know at Holwick that the child has any thoughts that way. You must act with all the caution you can command. Walter brought the testaments, and Anne chose the smaller one, which was most beautifully bound with little silver clasps. Walter wanted not to charge for it, but Anne pointed out that that would deprive him of the pleasure of being the donor. Before we retire, said Anne, I should like to ask you how you came to meet Andrew Woolridge. Do you know his story? You can be quite open with me, as I know why he left Holwick. Then for heaven's sakes, don't tell the people here, said Walter. The man is consumed by remorse. 
Though he tries to pass it off lightly, he is honestly trying to do everything that he can. You are not the only one who has sent a present to Mistress Eileen. I can tell you that much, and if Andrew knew who you were, he would not mind. He is a changed man since he left Holwick. He told me that the vision of the child haunted him day and night. He does not like to talk about the child, but really, if I believed in spells, I should think the child had magic in her. I never saw a man so completely spellbound, and I must confess that although I only saw her once, she holds me almost as though I were enchanted. It is the same here, said Anne. It is a most marvelous thing, Walter continued, because she seems quite unconscious of it. Not in all my experience have I ever met or heard of anything like it before. That's three of us, in fact, the only three people that we know anything about, and it may be the same with everyone she meets. They talked a little longer, and Anne discussed his plans for taking up the Pac-Man's life when he had gathered sufficient money as means of spreading his message through the land. Then, as the hour was getting late, they went to their rooms. End of chapter 17 Recording by Jennifer Whisk.